I'm Jack McDowell, and this is my moment. Jack McDowell is a former Major League pitcher who was born in Van Nuys, California and attended Notre Dame High School. He was drafted by the Boston Red Sox in the 20th round of the 1984 MLB draft, but did not sign. Jack chose to attend Stanford University, where as an All-American, led the Cardinal to the 1987 College World Series Championship. On June 2nd of the 1987 MLB Draft, the Chicago White Sox selected Jack as the fifth overall pick in the first round and made his Major League debut on September 15, 1987. Jack was selected to the Major League All-Star Game in 1991, 1992, and 1993. After posting a 22-10 record, a 3.37 ERA, 158 strikeouts, and leading the Chicago White Sox to win the American League West Division title, Jack won the 1993 American League Cy Young Award. He would continue his Major League career with the New York Yankees, the Cleveland Indians, and the Anaheim Angels over the next six years before completing a 13-year professional career. In 2012, Jack was inducted into the Notre Dame High School Hall of Fame. Jack currently resides in Charlotte, North Carolina and is married to Carrie father to daughters Molly and Olivia, and sons Emmett, Lucas, Rhett, and Rory. I grew up in Van Nuys, California, the San Fernando Valley, um, and I'm the youngest sibling of four children. And my brothers and sisters are seven, eight, and 10 years older than me, so I was a little guy running around trying to chase my older brothers around a lot, and I think that had a lot to do with Kind of my progression as an athlete and my love for athletics was watching them play it and wanting to be them when I was so much younger. I was always a couple steps below them, following them around. But, you know, did the whole thing, played t-ball, played little league, played pony ball, um, American Legion ball, went to high school. And in high school, uh, I came from maybe, I think things are starting to change nowadays, but I came from maybe the last generation that if you were an athlete, you kind of played all the sports. I played football, basketball, and baseball, was uh, slightly recruited in football and basketball, um, heavily recruited in baseball. Once they realized that baseball was my sport, the other, the other sports kind of faded away. And by the time I was a senior, uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't play football my senior year. And um, uh, my senior year basketball ended a little bit early with uh, conflicts with uh, our head coach. <laughs> Um, which, which kind of was a, a, a thing that appeared with me a lot of times was a uh, conflict with coaches and conflict with different peoples. But, you know, I think that made me grow over time. Um, my senior year in baseball, we had an unbelievable high school baseball team. We won 27 straight games. We were the number one team in the nation. We lost in the semifinals of the playoffs right before playing in the finals and at Anaheim Stadium. One of those games is just a baseball game. You lost. We got shut out. We had weird things happen. I could go into detail about it, but hey, we lost a game and in baseball, it's really easy to do. So running 27 straight off was, was an amazing thing and a lot of fun. During that season, I already knew that I was uh, committed to go to Stanford the following year. Uh, most of the Pac-10 teams had, um, had recruited me. Uh, USC, especially, both of my brothers played at USC. My brother, uh, my oldest brother, Jim, won a national championship there in 1978. And Rod Dato was his coach. Rod Dato was on his way out. While he was recruiting me, I knew that he wasn't going to be the coach the following year. And... When he became aware of me committing to Stanford or coming close to committing to Stanford, he had me down to SC for one final time and told me as only Rod could that, you know, you know you're know, you a Trojan, son. You can't go up there with the eggheads. <laughs> and I ended up going up there with the eggheads, and it all worked out pretty good. Um, another real interesting story about my recruiting process was Coach Brock at uh, Arizona State. Uh, I was there. Barry Bonds took me around on my recruiting trip there. Showed me, you know, just what it was all about. Completely different than Stanford. It was, you know, mostly about sports. The academics were secondary as long as you stayed eligible. And everyone kind of kind of knew that. And Coach Brock, when he dropped me off at the airport, told me, you know, Jack, if I had a son who had a, sta a chance to go to Stanford, he'd absolutely go there. And I thought that was an amazing thing from 
a coach that I would have to play against for the next three years and, and have pretty good success against as well. Um, as that, as my senior year progressed and I knew I was going to Stanford, there was also uh, the pro scouts that were around. A lot of uh, pro scouts were at our games. We had, obviously, being the number one team in the nation, we had more than just me on the team. We had three players go to Stanford. We had one go to Cal State Fullerton. We had another pitch at Cal State LA. We had juniors who barely got any time that year playing college after that was probably 13 guys that played d1 college off of that team so there was a lot of scouts out there watching us and you know i didn't know where i was going to go you know in the draft they didn't, they didn't really tell you it wasn't as cut and dry as it is now it seems now they kind of have to know and they cut deals beforehand and things like that so you know there was a chance i could be a high pick there's a chance i couldn't get picked at all because i was going to stanford at that time if you were going to Stanford, you didn't sign professionally. If you were a junior at Stanford, you didn't sign. You came back for your senior year and played. And so that was kind of a wrench into the thing at that point. I think the only, the first junior to sign out of Stanford was Steve Bouchelle, and that was in 1983. And now we're talking, this was 1984, the following year, and I'm a Stanford guy, and so you're not going to sign. As it came down, Boston did draft me. They drafted me in the 20th round. But when it came down to it, offered me at the time what was pretty much second round money. So they took a shot, thought maybe they could, they could get me on board. And, and to tell you the truth, I was close. I knew I wanted to play baseball. And I knew the opportunity that Stanford allotted me. But I, I, I wanted to play baseball. I'm thinking, wow, I can go play pro baseball, something I really hadn't thought about. That summer, I was chosen to play on the uh, Junior Olympic team in 1984, um, which competed up in Kindersley, Canada. And I had probably the hottest 10 days of my life in baseball. Um, had an extremely good summer that summer leading up to that tournament, but had an unbelievable tournament. I think I, I struck out. 43 guys in 27 innings, three complete games with 43 punch outs. The first game against Canada, they batted uh, nine left-handers against me. One of them was Larry Walker. I ended up striking out 18 guys and going four for four with two doubles. It was like, you know, the, I was on top of the baseball world for that age at that time. I was able to beat Cuba during that tournament as well. So I came back. After that tournament, thinking, wow, Boston's going to come back and they're going to up this offer and I'm going to have to really think about it. Well, as it turns out, they didn't up the offer. It stayed where it was and we decided to go to Stanford and, and it worked out well and the rest is history. The freshman year at Stanford, um, I came in there on, as Stanford usually did, a senior heavy team. Not a lot of guys left after their junior year, even if they were going to play professional baseball, they like to stick around finish their degree. That was just the, the Stanford way and the mentality back then. So I came in as a freshman and there weren't a whole lot of openings. I went up there as a pitcher slash shortstop. Got a little bit of uh, look-see at shortstop and then they kind of slid me into the pitcher slot, which is probably a wise choice. Um, wasn't one of the weekend starters until we started league. And a couple series into league, our Sunday starter had a couple of tough outings, and we got behind Arizona State, I think by five or six runs in like the second inning. And I came into that game, shut him down the rest of the game, and we ended up winning that game. Shut him down the rest of the game, as I'll point out, other than the 480-foot home run from Barry Bonds. Um, straightaway center over the flagpole, for those of you who know anything about Stanford Stadium, unbelievable. Um, that was the only run I gave up, and that kind of locked me into that starting rotation and being in the rotation. I was the Sunday starter through the duration of the season, and then by the time we went to playoffs and went to the College World Series, I was the number two guy behind Jeff Ballard, who had a nice little big league career as well, who was our number one starter senior that year. Um, we were rated number one for most of the season, number one going into the College World Series, but just to you know, let you know how that all works. We, we got beat up in the World Series. We won one game. I beat Arizona, um, and we lost to 
I believe Miami two times and that was that and we were out of the World Series and um, that was that was tough because to me that was the highlight of what you could do in sports you know, I, I thought about pro ball, but watching my brother win a national championship and how big that was to our family and to uh, the, the baseball in general, just the, how cool that was and getting a chance to watch it and getting to leave school and go back there and watch it and kind of be a part of it as a, as a, a kid growing up playing the Little League. That was it. That's what you wanted to do. And that's what, we, that's what we wanted to do. So we came back sophomore year, lost in the, the regionals back at Oklahoma State. And there was a lot of John back and forth between us and Oklahoma State that year. And when they knocked us out, finally, we went back that January. We had a, a birthday party at my house. And January is my birthday month. We had a birthday party. It just happened to, to uh, correspond with our recruiting trip of Mike Messina, who was in town at the time. And he was really kind of quiet, but he got to witness one of the coolest things in Stanford history was us sitting there and having a toast um, to winning the national championship the following year, which was my junior year in 1987, and someone threw in, and we're going to beat Oklahoma State. And everyone went nuts. And it turns out that's exactly what happened. We both got there. We ended up losing to them the first game of the World Series then beating them in the finals. And uh, a nice little twist to that College World Series in 1987 was Robin Ventura going into that had a 58 game hitting streak. Well, the first time we played him, um, he went 0 for 4. I think I got him three times. And then left-handed uh, reliever Al Osuna, who also played in the big leagues, um, got him out the fourth time. It was just an absolute rocket off our second baseman's chest that they called an error. Could have gone either way, but they called it an error. His hitting streak was officially done. So they beat me up. But I got Robin out four times, but on the other end, then in the finals, when I beat them, he was four for four. So, you know, it's, it's, it's funny how the individual versus team things work out sometimes. Um, but we, we were in that with, you know, a bunch of us about to be drafted also during that College World Series. And the strange thing about it is Stanford, the way it, it, it plays out, a lot of these schools are done with school. And we were still taking finals. We're back there taking finals. I took my freshman year, I took two finals on the plane ride home from Omaha. This year, the, 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 my, my junior year, it was the same thing. We're having to go take proctored exams over at uh, schools around Omaha, and it was nuts. It was crazy, but you're trying to keep everything in line. It's drafted by the White Sox in the first round. We kind of knew that I was going to be somewhere in the first 10 picks. We were trying to sneak down to the Dodgers, which I believe were seven or eight that year. Didn't happen, you know, being an L.A. boy. Chicago White Sox picked me. It probably worked out well um, because I was able to go to the big leagues quickly, um, seeing as they were in transition. And, and, and the Dodgers tended to keep their prospects down until they were absolutely ready to come up to the big leagues. So I think that, that saved me a few years of big league time by actually going with the White Sox. Having the draft fall during the College World Series when you're back there playing is, is just kind of an interesting time because there really isn't time to focus on what is actually happening. You, you kind of know, for the most part, the guys that are going to get drafted, you kind of have an idea that you're going to get drafted. You may not know where you're going to go, and some guys maybe later picks, you know. But when it happens and you're back there playing, there's not much time to think about that because you've, you've spent the last – two, three, seven years thinking about getting to the College World Series, playing college ball, winning a World Series, and now you're one of the eight teams back there. And it kind of gets pushed aside. I didn't think much about where I was drafted, what was going to happen, any of that. And I really, I didn't know, and I didn't really think about it when I was back there at the College World Series. It was all about winning. And, and the fu funny thing was, is talking to my White Sox teammates a couple of years later, they had watched the games. Once they had drafted me, they watched the next game when I pitched the first game against Oklahoma State and lost and gave up a couple home runs and didn't look very good at all. And they're just, you know, guys laughing, going, are we crazy? This is the guy we picked. Are you kidding me? And, you know, I ended up uh, four or five days later um, pitching for that in that championship game against the same team and beating them. Um, so, you know, maybe they saw, hey, at least there's a guy that can bounce back as well. 
Um, but there was nothing like that, nothing like winning the College World Series and, and even anything that I did professionally, just because I never did win a, a World Series title. And you can win at individual awards, but you can always, always improve on your individual years. But the only thing that you can do where at the end of the year you say we can't do anything else is to win a team championship. You stand out there and you go, we've accomplished everything that we set out to accomplish. You can't do any more than we've done. And I feel privileged and honored to have been able to do that one time in college. That still is the highlight of my, my baseball playing career. I was drafted in June and we went back and forth on contract negotiations with the White Sox for the end part of June through July and the week before we had to make a decision whether I was going to go back to Stanford or sign, I ended up signing. And there was a lot of things on the table. There was going back to the Stanford team where a lot of my, my teammates were still there. We had just won their first national championship in baseball. We knew we were going to have a great team the next year as well. Um, another thought was it was the Olympic year and I really, really wanted to play on that team, wanted to be a part of that team um, from the experience that I had on the juniors out of high school and just the group of guys I knew we would have. They did end up going on to win the gold that year. And I, I look back on that and I, I think all the time what was better. You know, it's one of those things where it's one of those decisions where I go, hmm, which one? Get into the big leagues quickly because it was the White Sox or, you know, maybe going to win a gold medal and win another national championship. But yeah, that's just one of those things I, I do think about. But anyway, getting back to the White Sox, show up with the White Sox. We had negotiated in that contract to kind of bridge the gap monetarily that I would be called up in September. And basically that would give me a few more dollars to get me tighter to what uh, Ken Griffey's signing bonus was for that year, who was the number one overall. So we were trying to just get in line with, with what that was all about, the way negotiations go. And while I was playing, I played a little bit in rookie ball just to make sure that, you know, I was ready. They sent me off to double A, made, I think, four or five starts there. A couple of them I got absolutely killed. A couple of them I threw really well. Um, and before the last start that I made in double A, our pitching coach, Mo Drabowski, calls me over and he goes, hey, um... I just got the call and you're starting on Tuesday in Chicago. And I said, are you serious? That world wasn't supposed to pitch up there. I was just supposed to go up there and hang out and, you know, get a few extra bucks and see what it was like. And he goes, now Rich Dawson just went down with a shoulder injury and you're going to take his September starts. And I was like, okay. And we sat there and that was my side day that day. And we sat there and Mo went through the Minnesota twins line up with me while I threw my side day. Okay, this is Al Newman, this is Ken Herbeck, how are you going to pitch him, this is what we're going to do. Here's Kirby Puckett, here's this and that, and I'm just sitting there going, okay, did not knowing what's going on. So you know, I get called up five days later, and sure enough, you know, the day before I'm on the chart, next day I'm uh, in the big leagues and starting, and my whole family was back in Chicago at Old Comiskey Park getting to watch it, and got to pitch against the team that would be the eventual World Series champions that year, uh, Minnesota Twins. And, and an interesting side note to that whole thing is the Minnesota Twins, along with the White Sox at that time, were in the AL West. And so the Twins were fighting with the A's for first place. There wasn't any wild cards. It was either you won the division or not. And so they were having a battle going, and there was a big to-do about – a rookie starting against uh, a team in playoff contention. And, and uh, the Oakland A's make a big stink about it in the press, how, you know, how they do this, how they start in a rookie against the Twins. We're trying to catch them. And sure enough, I throw against them, throw seven shutout innings and beat them, and they're happy. And then Minnesota's mad that, oh, they throw a rookie, no one knows about him, and it's not. Just funny how, how things change and how the, the little stories in the background that, that a lot of people don't get. So September 1987, I'm called up. I get ended up getting four starts, three more starts after that uh, Minnesota Twins game. Um, won three of them. The one game that I lost, I left with a two-run lead in the eighth inning and, and ended up uh, blown save, cost me that win. 
Um, so all of a sudden it was, you know, I went from, hmm, he's going to get a cup of coffee for a monetary adjustment to they're going to have to make a decision on whether to keep me the following year. Well, I, I did. I stayed the next year, pitched the entire season, my rookie year on a team that was really needed to be transitioned and was the following year. Um, towards the end of my rookie year, I sprained my ankle, um, backing up third base during a start. And I ended up taping it up and pitching the rest of the game, but I slightly pulled a groin while pitching with my ankle tape because my mechanics were just a little bit off and it wasn't good. So I went out the next inning and completely blew it. So I was done. I was done in, in uh, September from that year and came back the following year and still really, you know, they, they didn't really follow you much back then. It was like, you got hurt, you know, they didn't stay on it and say, hey, how's your groin doing? I didn't know how to rehab it. I just kind of let it heal and then came back and I was really having trouble with it coming back and struggled in spring training, spent the next year down in the minor leagues in, in AAA trying to get not only the groin back, but my stuff back and messing with mechanics and things like that. I ended up that year having to, having to, just say enough's enough, go home and go study high school film. I went home for a week and just said, listen, I need to take a little time off. Studied high school film, said I need to get my mechanics back. This is ridiculous. What they're trying to do with me is locking me up. And, you know, it turns out that once I did get back to that, I was back on the fast track again. Um, the following season, I uh, was able to get back in the rotation. Um, won 14 games that year. And at the end of that year, you know, we didn't have a great team, but we had a pretty decent team. I think we won 90 games. Maybe I think we were in second place of the A's who were killing people, the, the Bash Brother eras and the 20-game the run of Dave Stewart and all that. And we were kind of the little team that was uh, starting to build and kind of uh, nipping at their heels at that point. Um, but winning 14 games and going home and going, you know what? I really didn't have that good of a year. I didn't feel like I had a great year. And I'm like, I won 14 games. You know, you imagine if all of a sudden a couple things click, you know, it's not that far from being one of those guys that are one of those guys. And you never know where you're going to fall when you get into the game. You look around and you say, well, I'd love to be this. I'd love to be that. But you just kind of do it and kind of see where you fall. So and my whole thing was looking at it and kind of setting a new goal and saying, hmm, I'm seeing all these guys that are winning upper teens and 20 wins and kind of watching what they're doing and try to get better, try to figure out what they're doing you know, realized just by winning 14 games that, hey, you know, this is something I could do. And the following year I came back, and that, that year in 1991 I think was probably, in my opinion, my best year. It was probably my, the, the most dominant that I was in the big leagues. Um, I won 17 games. Um, I had 15 complete games. Had the most strikeouts. I never struck out 200, but I struck out 191 that year. But it was, you know, I was the pitcher. I went out there and, and I threw eight or nine innings every single game and, and won 17 games. And I think that year there were like four or five blown saves where I look and I go, hmm, okay. So if, if I don't come out with a lead, you know, you, you finish 15 games, but still you're having five blown saves. That's not a real good combo. Um, so, I'm like, you know, I kind of realized, hey, I, I'm there. And that year I, I won – 10 games at the break and had a chance to be considered for the all-star team and did get it, did get to be in the all-star game in 91. And it was in Toronto, my first all-star game. And the funny story about that is we had a big brawl with Toronto earlier that year, actually probably a couple weeks before the all-star game. Um, Jimmy Key had thrown a couple pitches up and into our left-handed hitters. He threw one behind Ozzie Gann's head which probably a lot of guys would have at that time as Ozzy was a little crazy. But then he threw a pitch right at Robin Ventura's face that Robin blocked with his hand. Could have broken his wrist, could have had him out for the year. He was my roommate at the time, and I was the guy. Hey, you know, look what they did, Jack. You go get him your next start. I'm like, well, why don't you guys get him this start? No, it, it all came down to me. So sure enough, we face him in Chicago five days later. I know I've got to go after somebody. And it just so happened that John Olerud swung on a 3-0 pitch and hit a home run off me in about the second inning. 
And, and so he kind of cherry picked me for that. And, and, you know, it kind of frustrated me, but it kind of pushed me over the edge knowing that I was going to go after somebody that game anyway. The next pitch, Mark Witten was hitting. That's probably a bad idea to be thrown after at this guy. Threw a ball behind him, you know, right behind his butt. Didn't hit him, but it's kind of like, you know, send the message back, Jimmy, you're not going to do that to our hitters. And, and sure enough, here he comes. We have a big brawl. I'm thrown out, he's thrown out, we're suspended, and blah, blah, blah. But I go to my first All-Star game in Toronto, and it's a crack up to watch it now because, you know, the American League, guys, everyone's going crazy. It's American League, American League City, you know, and here we come. It's Jack without boo. I mean, the biggest boo I probably ever got in my, in my whole career was my first All-Star game in my kind of home stadium because it's the American League. And so, you know, that kind of put me, put me at ease. Knowing that I, at least I was hated everywhere, so it made it, it made it kind of even. Um, once again, didn't know if I was going to pitch that game. Tony Russo ended up pitching me two innings, and you know, which you know, for a starting pitcher, they not too many guys in the middle of a game get to pitch two innings, and um, it was a blast. We won that game. I got a chance to go to three All Star games. We won all three of them. In 1992, I got to do the same thing. I, I had won, I believe, 11 games at the break was able to be on that all-star game that was in National League City in San Diego. Another uh, great opportunity. Got the pitching inning there. We uh, killed the National League, so that was two for two for me. And the following year, that, that year I also won 20 games. I won 20 games that year, just kept progressing. It was pretty much a real similar year as the year before when I won 17. Cut down from five blown saves to two blown saves or three, something like that. So that difference made the difference between 17 wins and 20 wins. And, you know, my first 20 win season and I realized, hey, you know, I can do this. Come down to the Cy Young voting, I was a uh, runner up to Dennis Eckersley, who won the MVP as well as the Cy Young that year. And so I knew, hey, now I'm in the elite. Now, you know, you got to try to stay there. But you know, being so close to winning that Cy Young, you start thinking, hmm, you know, maybe that's something that I'd really like to shoot for. And, and to say that I didn't have that on my mind, you know, I did. Is you're out there as a team, but, you know, it's not like it's going to change my mentality when I go out to pitch of wanting to win an individual award or being interested in an individual award as a pitcher. Because how you get that? Well, you're successful on the field, and that's going to help your team. But it also turned out I was the guy that had to throw and hit everybody, too, so... Uh, that helped. That helped as well. Um, so '93 comes along. I was Cy Young runner-up the year before. Going to that season, got off to a tremendous start. 13 wins at the break. Um, All-Star game was in Baltimore, and probably would have been the starting pitcher had I not thrown nine innings on Sunday in Baltimore against Baltimore. Um, a complete game. Nowadays. I would have had no shot. If you pitch on that last weekend at all as a starting pitcher, you don't get to pitch in the All-Star game. I pitched a complete game on Sunday and then ended up throwing an inning Tuesday and actually getting the win. You know, and I look at the thing and I'm going, these days, you know, maybe I wouldn't have done anything these days had I had the chance, you know, the way they've changed everything. But, uh, you know, that's another thing I'm proud of is winning an All-Star game. Being at the, That was basically being at the right place at the right time, you know, getting three outs and then having our team score and everyone else to, to get outs behind us. But, Three for three in the All-Star Games, that was great. Um, ended up finishing that season real strong. That was the year that we finally overtook the Oakland A's and got to the playoffs, uh, got to win a division. Um, that was what we had been working towards. You know, once we had this young team in 1990 and kind of crept at them, crept at them, crept at them, and once we kind of put it together and everyone settled into their places, we were able to compete with them. And... Um, was uh, an amazing little run and, and, and a great team we had back then. Uh, we ran into a buzzsaw in the playoffs, which happens. So 1993's season end, a little bit bittersweet. Um, bitter at the beginning because we lost in the playoffs at Toronto. They ended up winning it. They, they beat me up pretty good that year. 1993, uh, I win the Cy Young. I win 22 games. They beat me five times that year. They beat me three times during the season and twice in the playoffs. So they, they did have my number. Um, you know, there's all this speculation. Well, they had your pitches. They were flashing signs over this and that. Who knows? You know, they were also pretty good. It might have been one of those things where, where you know, I just wasn't on my game. 
and they were throwing their normal game out there and that happens sometimes you run into that and and it goes that way so you go home over that seat after that season you know disappointed as heck now we come into the award season which i knew i had a chance to win the cy young um the runner-up that year would be randy johnson so he was probably my biggest competition he had won 19 games i had won 22 but he had 300 strikeouts you know a little lower era than i did and so it was you didn't know how the the votes were gonna gonna sway that year um but i remember being in my house in chicago and getting that call because it's one of those things when you when you have a chance to win an award like that you don't get the call that says you're in second place or third place or fourth place you either get the call or you sit around for an hour waiting for the call and you don't get a call and uh you know having that phone ring right about the time that you know they said the call will come at this time was uh, pretty amazing pretty fun and you know obviously is a highlight of my career uh, the funny thing about about awards and things like that all-star games 20 20 game winner this and that whatever you do in professional sports kind of the highest place that you reach is what you're always defined as you know, if I, if I was a 20-game winner and never went to an All-Star game, I would get introduced as 20-game winner Jack McDowell. And if I was an All-Star, say I only won 15 games at the most, but I was an All-Star one year, it would be former All-Star. It's like the highest place you get, um, it kind of defines you for the rest of your life. And, and now I'm former Cy Young Award winner Jack McDowell. And, you know, there are definitely worse places to be and worse uh, monikers to have than that. So after the, the 1993 season, we go into 1994. Once again, you know, we're coming off a really good year. We're projected to be, you know, the tops in the West, the playoff contender, this and that. A lot of young guys coming into their own. Um, I started off completely horribly that year. I think I was two and seven with a seven something ERA. Um, I remember sitting in, not sitting, but being in the outfield during batting practice and talking with one of my fellow pitchers and going, do you know that if I right now ran off a streak of consecutive scoreless innings that broke Oral Hershiser's record, that I would just barely get under four for an ERA. And that was, you start thinking that way. And that's when you start getting yourself in trouble. Um, and I ended up uh, uh, actually having a pretty good finish to that year. Um, we were, we were, I ended up, I was two and seven with a seven and I ended up 10 and nine with a three, eight. So it was pretty close to that run. There were a couple runs mixed in, but, uh, I ended up once I did turn around, had a pretty good run. And that was the year that, uh, the strike killed the world series. And I hear a lot about a lot of people talk about Montreal Expos. They were the best team in this and that. There, were, there wasn't even any, any doubt that we were the best team. The best team doesn't always win, but we went into that. We were going to go into that playoff season with two all-star pitchers that, that year, Jason, uh, Jason Bure and Wilson Alvarez. Me and Alex Fernandez started off slowly in the first half, but in the last month of the season, I think Alex was 6-0 with like a 2-5 ERA, and he got pitcher of the month, and I was 5-1 and one with like a 1-4. And we both had like 45 to 50 strikeouts. I mean, we were on fire, and the other two guys were throwing great. We had four guys absolutely lights out, and we're ready to go into this. You know, Frank Thomas winning the MVP. He had Robin Ventura in the, the prime of his career. All those guys were ready to roll. And uh, so we were pretty disappointed that that, that – you know, ended up happening also, and and actually during that strike, I was traded to the Yankees, and when that whole thing broke, boy, it was fast. Same thing, I got a call, hey, uh, you know, hey, the strike's over, and we'll see in Fort Lauderdale in two days, and I was like, uh, huh, who, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's going on here? And that's just how it went, and I showed up, I was with the Yankees, and that year in 1995, um, a lot of people think that I didn't have a good time in New York or that, you know, it was too tough or this and that because there was an incident that happened um, when I uh, ended up raising my middle finger to the home crowd, which didn't go over very well. But actually put me on their good side and um, 
everyone pulled behind me and we ended up getting to the playoffs that year for the first time in a number of years actually Don Mattingly's entire career that was the only time that he was able to play in the playoffs is that 95 playoffs and um you know we just kind of dragged them there and that group of guys and that team was one of the funnest years I had just top to bottom the guys that were on that team were professionals fun gamers and that's all you can ask for and then to have George Steinbrenner behind you who you know is going to do everything he can to win and he did, you know, he ended up bringing in David Cohn, which was a huge addition to uh, the starting rotation. And, and we ended up getting to that playoffs and losing a tough one to Seattle. But, you know, that's that's the highlight I get to see of myself uh, the most is um, in relief pitching against Randy Johnson uh, and the Mariners walking us off in the 10th, was it 10th inning or 11th inning? I don't know, but that's the one that they always show. Edgar Martinez, um, hitting the double and Joey Cora and Ken Griffey coming around to score and beating us by a run. And, you know, I, I look back and I go, man, it was, it's kind of cool that I was in there. Um, the one thing, the one story I like to tell about that is I say, Hey, do you know who I came in for? And then I was like, no, who'd you come in? I came in for Mariano Rivera. They put me in. So all of his uh, records that he had in the postseason, I had a little help in that because I saved his runners. That first inning that he came in, I didn't give up those runs, Mo, so you owe me that. Come on, man. And uh, after that season, 95 season, they fired Buck Showalter, didn't know who was going to be the manager there. I ended up signing with uh, the Cleveland Indians, a uh, two-year deal, and playing with them for two years. I played for, for the first year, had a real good start, not so great end. We uh, went to the playoffs that year. We lost to Baltimore, who was the wild card at that point. And um, we won the start. I pitched against Mike Messina, uh, another Stanford guy. Um, and we ended up winning that game. I didn't get the win, but we won that game. It was the only game we won in that series. And uh, we got knocked out there. Following year, I got hurt, had surgery, and had a, a botched surgery on my arm that killed a nerve in my elbow. And from that point on, I was pretty much done. I tried to pitch for the next two years. Uh, the Angels picked me up to see, you know, what I could offer. And I was able to make a handful of starts here and there. But other than that, I was uh, basically just rehabbing and trying to get back on the mound. Decided that that was enough. You know, once, once I got out there and, re and realized that it was no longer about competing, it was about competing to actually get on the mound to compete against other players. You know, I fought so hard just to get back on the mound. And then you get on the mound and you go, oh, yeah, there's a big league hitter up there and he wants to kill me. We're, we're in trouble. That's when, you, that's when you're in trouble and you know that you, know, you probably don't have a real good chance of succeeding. And that's when, uh, you know, I was, I was uh, able to step away at that time, um, sadly. But, you know, looking back on it, I've had a lot of cool memories since. So uh, my career, I was, I was lucky to get into it right away out of college. Uh, because the the kind of freak injury that happened to me that ended my career. I mean, I was 30 years old when that happened. So that's usually right when you're in your prime, and I was pretty close to being in my prime. So I look at it and I go, you know, I didn't get that second half of my career to be the veteran guy that, say, a Carlton Fisk was or a Charlie Huff was or a Jerry Royce was to me. Guys that were in their upper 30s at the tail end of their career had done so much and really could help a 21, 22-year-old kid figure out how to transition to the big leagues and do things. And, and, you know, while I didn't get that, you know, coming back out, I, I ended up having, uh, doing music for a little bit, but then getting back into baseball and coaching, coaching youth ball. And for the past two seasons, uh, managing in the Dodgers minor league organization. And looking at that, I feel like that kind of fills and will fill the void of not being able to be that guy as a veteran you know, because now I'm able to, to, to mentor all these kids and to teach them all these things that I learned along the way. And the, the biggest thing, the biggest thing I learned just from being a player and now, and now being a coach and then sitting in a professional meeting with an entire organization talking about players is, yeah, you're, yeah there are a few guys where your physical abilities are just going to take you no matter what kind of player you are, no, no matter what kind of teammate you are, no matter your attention to detail or not. But for the most part, it's all about small things. When you get to pro ball, everyone's pretty close to being the same guy. 
you're the same guy. You know, I manage in rookie ball. Everyone's throwing 95, 96 miles an hour. There's guys that touched 100. There's guys running three fours to first base. There's guys stealing bases. There's guys making plays that are big league plays. What it comes down to is consistency. Consistency and the little things in baseball. And it's becoming more and more important as we as we move on and transition out of the steroid era back into playing baseball again and having that be important. Um, doing the right things, um, doing the right things defensively, being in the right places, running the bases correctly. You wouldn't believe the emphasis on guys being able to run the bases and, and being able to move up in a professional setting. And I've always been a huge fan of that because I think it's an area that can be exploited because not everybody busts it on the bases or pushes things as much as they should. And on the other end, I don't think the outfielders work as hard on their defense and throwing as they used to. And I think the combination of that and uh, the things that you can pick up and the scouting reports that you have, I think that, that that's one of the biggest areas right now. The little things in baseball. Being a good teammate, that's huge. This guy a good teammate? No, it's kind of, you know, the, a lot of the guys don't like him on the team. Well, you know what? They're not going to move that guy up. Or that guy's not going to have a good chance to, to succeed. If your talent level is the same as somebody else and you're not a good teammate, you're not going to move. You know, and you're probably not going to play. If you're a high school guy going to college and you're not a good teammate and you get to college and you're not a good teammate, you better be really good. You better be like future MVP, MLB MVP good to even get a chance to play. It's all about being a teammate because baseball is a team sport and they can break down stats and come up with new stats and move shifts and, and have these ideas that, uh, you know, they can change the way baseball is done and change the way we think about this team sport. But it comes down to which is the group of guys that's going to play the hardest, which is the group of guys that's going to pull for each other and going to be there and, and going to lift each other up. That's who wins. And you get to pro ball and you go, when, when there's a group of uh, you know, fully mature men with families and they're acting like kids out in the field and doing crazy stuff and having fun, they're going to win. They're going to win, and that's the bottom line, and it's been proved year in and year out. So that, that would be my one thing to tell everybody. Have fun with it. Um, try to do the right thing. Listen to your coaches. All your coaches are trying to do the right thing, trying to help you out. You know, In one respect, you need to know yourself, but on the other things, trust the guys that you're working with. For the most part, you know, they know a little more than you do at that time in your life. I'm Jack McDowell, and that was my moment.